beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, the children of Israel, after having been delivered from their bondage, the bitter bondage as slaves in Egypt, and having wandered in the wilderness for the past 40 years, were at this point in time in our chapter ready to cross over the river Jordan into the land of Canaan which God had promised to give them. Moses, their leader, was at this time also about to die. And so he gathered all the people together to deliver, as it were, his swan song, which really was basically Moses conveying the message that God wants his people to know. God wanted his people to know how they ought to live as God's covenant people in the promised land. And that message begins with the reminder of what God had done for them, detailing the deliverance that God has given to them and the Lord's faithfulness and provision for them even throughout their whole journey in the wilderness until this point. Therefore, at this point, before they cross over to inherit that land, Moses charged the people of God in verse 1 and 2. He says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. That was the charge for the children of Israel on that day. But it is also a charge for you and I as Christians because in the same sense as believers, we too have been delivered from the cruel bondage of sin and Satan. And we have been given all the blessings necessary for this pilgrim journey, for our salvation. And therefore, we too have the high calling that God has laid upon us as Christians to obey His Word together with our children and their generations after them. So first of all, we want to consider that God commands us not to have other gods before Him. Verse 4, we read, Hear, O Israel, listen carefully, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord, Jehovah God, is the only true and living God. And what a wonder when we notice Moses did not say the Lord God is one, although it's true that there's only one God, but he says here, the Lord our God is one. In other words, this speaks of that unique relationship that God has with His people Israel. Jehovah, our God, the Lord, our God. There is this personal relationship that is declared here that the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth is our God. God has not done this to any other nations. He has done this only for you, Israel. You are the most privileged. You are the most blessed of all men because God has come to you and entered into this relationship and fellowship with you so that you can say this almighty God, this Jehovah God is our God, is my God. And not the Lord, capital L or R-D, as we often said, is that covenantal name of God, Jehovah, which He reveals only to His covenant people. He is the one who comes to His people and claims them, make them His own. While they were yet sinners, while they were still in their condemnation, undeserving of any good from God, God comes and says, I'll make you my people. Here, 
don't receive the amazing grace and mercy of God. It is merely out of His grace and mercy that He would do so. And therefore, hear, listen up, O Israel. Listen up, all believers, all people of God. The Lord, Jehovah, is our God. Yes, this was originally addressed to Israel, but it is addressed to all believers, to you, to me as Christians. God has become our God because He has given Himself to us to claim us for Himself. We didn't seek after God on our own because by nature we were all dead in sins and trespasses. None of us will want to seek after God, but God came to our lives and claim us for Himself, so that now we are His, and we can say He is ours. By His grace, He did that. By His grace, He sent His only begotten Son to be our substitute, to bear the curse and punishment due to our sins, and to fulfill all righteousness which we ourselves are never able to achieve. We're supposed to obey God fully, but none of us can because of our fallen nature. But Jesus, our substitute, fulfilled all righteousness. All these are of grace. None of us deserve God to do that for us at all. And so today, if you are a Christian, if you have received such salvation from God, what a wonder this is to consider that the only true and living God should pay such a high price for unworthy, ill-deserving sinners like you. in order to make us his peculiar people. And therefore, verse 14, he says, you shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. Of course, God is not implying here that there are other gods or divine beings besides him. No, we know that it is a fact that there are no other gods but Jehovah, the one true God who is the first cause of everything, who is the creator of this universe out of nothing, simply by His almighty power. And this God commands His people, whom He has claimed and saved for Himself, not to follow, not to follow the Egyptians' God that they have come to know while they were slaves in Egypt, and also not to follow those gods which they will come to see when they get into the land of Canaan not to worship like them, not to go after their gods. There is no middle ground. We can only have Jehovah as God alone and none else. God's people are to be completely loyal to Him and not commit the sin of idolatry. Is it unreasonable for God to ask for total faithfulness to Him? Just like it's not unreasonable for a husband or a wife to expect their spouse to be totally faithful to them, isn't it? Because they belong to each other. And here we belong to God. And He expects total faithfulness and devotion to Him. Otherwise, we commit the sin of idolatry. And what is idolatry? Idolatry is to trust in something or someone other than God to bring happiness and satisfaction in our life. Or to put it in another way, to put it simply, an idol God is anything that is more important to you than God Himself. We live in a day and age where there are many things that threaten our undivided loyalty to the one and only true God. And a very common form of idolatry, very common form of God in our life is when one is so obsessed and fascinated by, by the things of this life in, in getting pleasure, in getting riches, in, in gaining money, fame, possession, in wanting to live a good life in this world to the point where God is obscured from our hearts and mind. 
And so God, through Moses, is reminding his people here in verse 10 and 11 that when you get into the land and enjoy the riches of the land that I have given to you, the plentiful enjoyment of good things that I have given to you, then verse 12 says, Be careful, lest thou forget the Lord, the Lord who delivered you, the Lord who bought you, the Lord who owns you. Idol gods is not just referring to, to those idols made of precious stones or gold or silver, but it can also be ourselves. The God of self can express itself in, in our insistence of having our own self-centered way. When we expect others to do what we want and so that when things are not going the way we like it then we throw the word of god out of the window we throw god's commands and instruction out of the window and do what i think i want to do and we behave in an unseemly manner and sin against god because we said i am actually the one sitting on the throne of my heart God will not tell me in this situation what to do, but I will decide because I am actually the God of my life. We may not say that, but when we act in disobedience to God, we are actually saying that, that I am my own God. Idolatry robs God of His rightful place in our hearts. Idolatry robs God of His glory from the hearts of God's blood-bought people. You are precious to God. Do not allow that to happen. You are not to have any other gods beside Him. So the question is, are we setting forth our lives in such a way that Jehovah is really our only God, that we do not allow our hearts to go after other gods. This is what is expected of us as Christians individually. So all of you that have made your confession of faith, all of us that have received baptism, that's not the end of the journey. We never retire from being the children of God. We continue to live and grow in Christ. And this is also what not, is not concerning only we ourselves. If you, by the grace of God, are parents, then we are also to teach our children because these children belong to God. And we are to tell our children that there is only one God in our lives, in your life, and that is Jehovah, our covenant God. Tell our children that God has called you into His covenant family. When He baptized you, when you were a little baby, when you were a little child, that was a mark of His claim upon you, telling you that you are His, you belong to Him. You are special, you're different. You're different from other children that are born in non-believing family. You are set apart by God for His glory. And that's why Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, that those children born in the home of even one believer are said to be holy in a sense that they are set apart, even if it is one parent who is a true believer, his child is set apart. It's called holy by God. Yes, as I said, they're no different from all other children. They are just as sinful. They are just as condemned in their sins. They are just in need of, as in need of Jesus Christ, the salvation in Christ, as any other children out there. But they are different because they have been placed in the family of believers, that God has placed them there with a special distinction and privilege that other children 
do not enjoy. Just like the children of Israel, they enjoy God's blessing. And not other nation in ways that not other nations enjoy. And so as the people set apart by God, we should not allow any other gods to interfere with that relationship. We cannot give our hearts and obedience to other gods. And that's why, verse 2, Moses charged them that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and your son and your son's son, not just you, because your son and in their generations to come, we are God's people. And so we have to teach them. Those of us who are parents, have calling have the calling not only to be faithful ourselves to God but also to shepherd our children by pointing out their idolatry in their hearts and to point them to God they are also prone to idolatry because God made us all human beings as spiritual beings we all will worship someone or something if it is not God, then it's something else. But God made us to worship Him. Sadly, after the fall of Adam and Eve, we reject God and we want to worship something else. And so our fallen children are that way too. There are idols in their heart. They themselves can be a God to themselves. And so you can see little children, even though you teach them how to, to share and to be generous, to be kind, but what happens when you put children to play together? They may fight with each other. They may grab things that they want and not allow others to have it. You see selfishness, you see sin. That no parents will teach their children to do that. But exactly because they have such idols in their hearts that we need to show it to them, teach to our children, no, our hearts must be given to God. We are to obey God. So children, children, you are to obey God. This command is for you as well because you are God's children. You belong to God's covenant people. Of course, those of us who are always thinking in the doctrinal way, you, you will say, well, but not every single children, every single uh, child of, of believers uh, will be saved. That's true because there's such thing as election. But we know in the Bible, God is the God of the covenant through the generation. That's how He works. He, he brings in His people through their line of generation. And so, we tell our children, you belong to God, that this is your God. We don't tell our children, uh, this is your God later when you are able to knowledgeably confess your faith then you can say it is your God. No, we tell them, you can say now that Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide, to wash away my sins. You can tell your children that, to believe in that. Jesus died for me because he has included me in his kingdom that I can call God my heavenly father and not wait till you're older, wait till you're able to understand and confess your faith. No, already right now, because God has brought you into His kingdom. So children, this God is also your God, that you can go to Him, you can pray, you can claim on the promises that He has given to us in His Word. Say that, I know God, you said you will forgive my naughtiness, my selfishness, my sin. Please forgive me because of Jesus Christ. Please help me to know how to obey you. Give me strength. You can pray the same too. Why? Because you are his child. So that's negatively. We must not have other gods before. We must not have other gods besides God, but Jehovah only. But positively, we are not only just not to have other gods, but we need to have God himself as our all. So we are to love him with all our heart, so and might. That's point two. Those of us who have attended the CTEL, the, the latest CTEL program, Dr. Ferguson reminds us that 
I quote, We are baptized into the name of the triune God. We are taken out of the name we had and we are now placed into the family of God. Therefore, we are to die to our old self and by the power of God walk in newness of life. That's what God expects of us. You have taken up the name of Christ. You say you are a Christian. You are a follower of Christ. And therefore, you will want to live for Him. So God says, as my people, verse 5, He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. God wants us to have complete devotion to Him with every breath we, we take, with every moment of every day, without unfaithfulness, without half-heartedness, but with fervent, undivided affection, we love Him. We love the God who first loved us and call us out of this condemnation of ours. Our love to God is always that response to that great love that He first has shown to us. It is not burdensome to the ears of an unbeliever that God should expect total devotion from us seems like it's so unreasonable, so high-handed. But to those who truly know the salvation that God has given us in Christ, we re respond in love, in thankfulness to Him, in gratitude to Him, because He is the one who deserves all our love and obedience, not just because of who He is in and of, our, of Himself, but also because what He has done for us in our lives and our children's life. And so verse 6 says, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Our hearts must be captured by the word of God. And verse 7, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. So again, instruction here for those who are parents, that it's not only that, that to realize that it is only when God's word is in your heart and my heart then will we be ready and eager to teach our children, isn't it? If you yourself are not convinced of obeying God, why would you teach your children to do that? It will be hypocritical. There are people like that. They don't want to come to church. They bring their children for Sunday school. Nah, you teach my children for me. Ah, I know God is good. God is good for them, but I don't need them. What are you telling your children if you do that? What are you telling your children if in your daily life, the way you handle disappointments, the way you handle temptations, what are you showing? Do you love God? Do our children see that in our lives, hear that in our prayers? That we, we love Him, we want to obey Him, that He is our only God? We are to teach them, not just on Sunday, but every day of our lives, and verse 6 to 7 tells us when you, when you are sitting down and standing up and all that, and, and you know, all the instruction of having, having God's Word everywhere, of course, that doesn't mean today we go home, we start pasting Bible verses all over the house. Well, there are pa people who, who, who do that. You know, I've been to houses where they have Bible verses on the fridge, on their chairs, on their bed, on their doors. Well, these are good if those are occasions where you can use to teach your children. The point is that as parents, we have to teach our children. God's Word, God Himself must be our focus. And so there are thousand and one opportunities each day to teach our children about sin, about forgiveness in Christ, about our blessings in God, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every little thing in life, things things that we face in life are teaching opportunities to our, to our children, to ourselves also. And so, ask ourselves as believers, what are we communicating to others in our lives? And as parents, what are we communicating to our children? When you are frustrated with your children, parents, why are you frustrated? Is it because you have loosed, your, you, you felt 
you felt embarrassed because your children misbehave in public instead of because you love God, you don't want them to disobey God in that way. You get angry because you feel that your, your child is not respecting you enough, is not obeying you, not, not doing whatever you want because I have given you everything. I've sacrificed so much for you. You must do what I want. Is that your attitude? Our reason must be because we love God and He is, only, he is our only God. Well, as I said, our time is up. We cannot, there are so many things here. And we can, and we, we, I, I believe it is enough for us to see how often we failed. How often we have idols in our hearts. As Calvin says, our hearts are idol factories. We are prone to do that. And how often we sin against God, sin against our children, and children, how often we sin against God, sin against our parents. How are we going to, to love God with all our heart, soul and might? Well, by ourselves we can't. The more we look at the law of God, the more we see how, how we fail God, how we cannot keep that. So what hope do we have? Well, the hope is in Jesus Christ. That's precisely the reason why Christ came in order to live and to die for us so that we may have forgiveness when we fail, so that He is the one who will carry us through. And that's why He gives us also His Holy Spirit so that by the power of His Holy Spirit, we might be strengthened and helped to walk in obedience to Him. That's the beautiful truth in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, where we we see there that by the cross of Jesus Christ, we no longer as His people live unto ourselves, but unto Him who died and rose again for us. And then by His power, we are able to do, to obey Him. Devotion to God is not a weekend thing. Only quite soon after we have been encouraged by our baptism and confession of faith, we say, oh, I'm going to live for God and then soon you forget about it. No, it's a lifelong thing. It must be every part of our life. It must be at all times, in all places. It must be when we are with believers and with non-believers. Every part of our lives must be because Jehovah, our God, is one Lord. So may God help us in all our lives to love Him with all our heart, soul and might to the praise and glory of His name till we shall meet Him face to face. Amen.